Job was a man who loved and feared God. He was a man of wealth and a large family. Stephen William Walker was born in Billings, Montana on April 7, 1936. Stephen was not a perfect man, but he was a very good one. He had many limitations put on him by the era he was raised in, the circumstances of his childhood, and even the way his mind was wired. Even though I am certain there are things in this, things that he did and did not do here in this life that he now regrets very much, I believe he did the very best he could with what he was both blessed by and challenged with. He was incapable of obfuscation, insinuation, or innuendo. You saw what you got straight up the imperfect Montana cowboy. The very best he could do every time. I once had a conversation with my dad about the boxes he kept in his mind. He said when something happened that hurt him, that he could not fix, he would put it in a box in his mind and shut the door. And whatever pain was left, you just went on. You couldn't do otherwise out on the ranch. What we all saw was what was left after those little boxes were closed. He was also a man who forgave. He, when he, while he struggled and was hurt by many in his life, he forgave them all. He prayed for those who hurt him and wronged him. He wanted the best for them. He wanted them to be happy. I have never known a man who more fully understood the power of the atonement to help forgive wrongs and pain that were done to them. Steve grew up on the Crow Indian Reservation near Lodgegrass. And you've heard some stories today and stories from my dad, and they're very likely from this time in his life. I can tell you stories about Shorty the Horse, King the Collie Dog, or Rufus the Rooster. I can tell you stories about hunting and fishing and bears, all of which you will probably have heard from him already. And if you haven't, hit me up afterwards and I'll tell you. <laughs> but the stories you may not have been told would be about the poverty and the struggle he had to go through to survive. He won't have told you that his mother had what they now believe to be bipolar disorder. It was difficult. He wouldn't have told you how he was bullied and how that made him want to love and accept all people in their differences. These circumstances shaped his worldview, especially of women, of money, and of communication. Despite the challenges he faced at home, Steve went on to attend Montana State University with two scholarships, one for football and one for academics. He didn't graduate. Instead, he joined the Army. He was given the option to join the first year of the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. He didn't take it. Instead, he went to El Paso and he found the church. On December 27, 1956, he married Roxanne Butler. Shortly after, Carol shared with you the story of how Roxanne had decided to go to church and he didn't want to leave his new wife. And I'm very grateful that we got to hear that song that caused the spirit to strike him so strongly that he knew that the church was the place for him. Back to the story of Job. In the story, Satan tells God that Job only loves him because he prospers. Satan was then allowed to take from Job everything God had given him, even his health and his family. In Job 1 verse 20, after this has happened, Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and found out, fell down on the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be 
be the name of the Lord. My father went on to have many jobs. He was a cook, a demolitions expert, a military communications technician. He worked in Colorado, California, Montana, and Puerto Rico. My father and Roxana had seven children, two of who died very young. Those deaths were very hard for my father. They were things that went inside those little boxes. Eventually, in 1947, Roxana and my father divorced. This was a very difficult time for him. He felt lost. He felt he had lost his family and his blessings. He moved to Utah where he received a blessing from his state president that told him that what was lost would be restored to him again. He clung to this hope and to his faith during this time. Back to the story of Job. Job wondered why he had been born. To what purpose was his suffering? Job's wife spoke to him and told him to curse God and die. He then spoke with three friends and they discussed the nature of life, of suffering, why bad things happen to good people, and Job struggled with his faith. <coughs> My father began to attend a family home evening group in Utah. And in true Steve fashion, on his first evening there, he told everyone he was there to look for a wife. He met my mother there, and on April 30th, 1976, he married Janice Polanich. From this event, his life continued to be one of change and of loss. He had five more children, one of whom died shortly after birth. This death, along with those others, were things he struggled with. It was a pain he couldn't fix and didn't know how to live with. <coughs> he worked in construction. He worked in computer sales. He worked in jewelry replacement. And then the big one. He worked as a computer and communications consultant in Armenia. I don't have time to tell you all the stories that come out of that three years in Armenia, but I will, what I will share with you is how it shifted him. It changed his focus in his faith to one of drifting forward, to one of dedication. The story of Job again. Job sorrows for a time and asks why man is on earth. He questions why he is suffering. And then he asks one of the most important questions we can all ask on this earth. Job 14, verse 14. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Now we have to skip forward a good many years here as I've only been allotted 10 minutes to speak. <laughs> that change in focus he gained in Armenia led to a renewed vigor for family history. And Carol Schillis shared the story of how in 1957 he first had that spark, that spirit of Elijah, blood in his heart. In 2015, he received a call to serve as a missionary at the Family and Church, he Church History Headquarters in Salt Lake City. He taught the Family Search Program to leaders at the local church history centers and throughout the Southwest United States. Then he was assigned as a resolution specialist to handle difficult data problems. Even after he was released, he continued with his dedication to family history and temple work for the rest of his life. Back to Job again. Job then answers the question about what happens after we die. Job 19, verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet shall in my flesh I shall see God. One of the last things my father did in this life was to bear his testimony at his birthday party the week before he died. He spoke of Christ, of his faith in him, and how he knew that his life was quickly coming to an end, which he did not fear because he knew where he was going. 
and on April 15, 2022, surrounded both physically and spiritually by a family who loved him, he went home. I think we all knew a different Stephen Walker. The people of his youth knew a brash man, one who was teased and mocked for being different, who suffered through a difficult childhood, a youth who spent his time hunting, fishing, riding horses, and playing football. His older children spoke to a man who was always out there making friends, trying new things, sleeping in snow banks and flying airplanes. A disciplined, tough man. His four younger children knew a, a different man, a man who worked on computers, went to Armenia, slept away years sitting on the sofa, only to be diagnosed much later with severe sleep apnea, who parented in the way his youth taught him was right. The man my children knew was yet another man, one who sat and did family history and told stories and kept good memories like precious objects brought out to be admired, polished, cherished, and shared. None of us can in this life know the full truth of a person. In 1 Corinthians verse 13, chapter 13, verse 12, it says, For we now see through a glass, but darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, even as I am known. The truth is that Stephen Walker was none of these men and all of them. His life had many experiences that made him suffer, but they came with experiences that made him grow and changed him and made him strive to be better. They made him believe in God and Christ. To wrap up the story of Job, in the end, when Job stands fast in his faith, God restores to him all that was lost and more. While our personal experiences will have changed the way we saw him, I think when we take the sum total of his life, we get a glimpse of who he was trying to be, who he became, what the end product of this complicated, amazing, and challenging life was. I told you the story of Job because it is the story of my father's life. He lost and suffered many things. In the end, what mattered most to him was his faith in God. It doesn't say in the scriptures how Job felt regaining all he had lost, but I can tell you that the greatest joy in my father's life was what he saw as the regaining of his relationship with his children. His last year's focus especially on building a relationship with his older children, who he felt he had lost. He spoke to me of this, how grateful he was to be able to speak with them, to counsel them, to try to tell them that he loved them. He was so proud of his children. Most of all, he loved them very much. Steve loved his family and his wife. He loved God and he wanted to serve him. He wanted to fix anything that was broken, mostly using maybe wire, but also words. He wanted to share the gospel with anyone who would listen, both here and beyond the grave. He knew that Jesus is the Christ. He is our Redeemer. He knew that death was not the end, but the beginning. In Job 42, verse 17, the story ends. So Job died, being old and full of days. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here with you as well. Um, I've been uh, I've been tasked with sharing a few words, and, and I apologize. I'll kind of curtail my 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 thoughts a little bit. Um, about a month, maybe a month and a half ago, I had an opportunity to sit and talk with Stephen. Yeah. He gave me a charge to make sure I tell the Lord to do family history. <laughs> and uh, as, I, as I think about family history and the opportunities that I've had to participate, I can only think of a few stories that may underline many of the things that Brother Walker has shared with us. I share this uh, offered, share this uh, with him a few times. We we talk and we talk about family history and how how this is a, a real our fall in heaven's given us a plan of salvation, a plan of redemption. He's through his prophets and through revelation. We read in the scriptures as well as from from the pulpit we hear about this plan that. Before we came to earth, every man and woman lived. That we didn't uh, come into existence at earth, but before, beforehand, we lived our fall in heaven. That we came to earth for experiences, and one of the main, main things that we came here was to gain bodies, and then everything else was uh, was just uh, a benefit on top of that. After we, after we pass, we have opportunities to continue to learn. And that is the great blessing of family history. In the temple, in the sacred temples of our Savior Jesus Christ, work is done for those who have passed along, that they can be bound with their family for eternity. And the scriptures should read that this work was, was essential. Otherwise, the earth would be wasted at the coming of the Lord. And what does that mean? That basically means that there would have been no purpose for it. Save for the saving of the, of the life of every man and woman who's ever lived. So why do we go to the temples? Why do we, why do we serve there? So that these ordinances, this power of the priesthood, can be manifested. It is in the ordinances of the, and we find in the temple, the ordinances we, that are performed in the, in the chapels. These ordinances are where the power of the priest is manifest. So the underline or to underscore that, that experience or that's these, these comments, I think of the experience that I, that I had in my life where I had this nagging and I probably shouldn't call it nagging, it's probably not the right word, but this nagging to, to do some family history. And I didn't know anything about it, I didn't know what to do. But I felt I should go try to do something. So I started, started off and started creating a, a profile on a church site and then found my sister had done some work, so there were some names there. And it was great, and this nagging continued. But as this nagging continued, I started noticing that I, noticed that I felt the Spirit of the Lord. So I went and uh, we had some names together and there was oh, there's some names there, let's go take them. Took them to the temple. But that nagging didn't stop. And in fact, it increased. So I did some actual real work. I found there were some, some sisters in my family that had not been, had not received their, had not been taken to the temple. So we went, went and did that, got that stuff together. And at the time I was, Going through an MBA program, and I was super busy. My wife had the little kids. There's no time that we, we ourselves were able to go to the and see the names of the youth. And just before that, I had been woken up a few times at night thinking about the importance of getting this done. Sent those names with the youth. And I remember driving to school. It was about 5 30. 
and I felt the spirit in the most intense way. That Sunday we came back and Brother Vipperman came up to me and said, you know, uh, I had experience in the temple with one of those names. There's a sister Mary. And as we confirmed her, I thought there were people coming into the room, so much so that I opened my eyes multiple times to see and nobody had come in. And this, this was happening about 5.30. I felt real joy as those people were welcoming her into, into the church. And when he said that, I remember that about 5.30 I was driving and I felt this, uh, felt this uh, same, same thing. Now it's happened since, but I only say it just to emphasize that this work is true. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is to bind families for eternity. And who are we binding them to? We're binding them to us, our family, but also to our fall in heaven. That this long chain, this legal binding, binding chain, allows all of us the opportunity to return and live with him and to live the life that he lives. While salvation is free, eternal life is something that we've we got to work for. And we're given the path and the blessing and the opportunities to do so. Our fallen heaven loves us. Our Savior Jesus Christ has provided the way. And in our families, as Brother Walker said many times, we have the opportunity to save and bless our families. So Steve, I've completely assigned. We love you. We love you very much. We will give uh, President Boyd a few few moments, and then we will sing the Spirit of God in number two, and then we'll have a closing prayer. By Brother Andrew Durbin. I share this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's good to be here with you. Um, I had the privilege of being Brother Walker's bishop for about a year. And uh, it was nice to hear the, the expressions of the children that I wasn't the only one that would go for a, a 10 minute visit that turned into 45 minutes as I heard stories of his life. and experiences that honestly I thought I was visiting with the most interesting man alive from the experiences that he shared um, that were full of he, he lived a full life and grateful for that grateful for his commitment uh, there was never a time that I visited him that he didn't want to teach and, and lift and, and, and help you leave with greater faith greater strength and his eagerness just to be a disciple and, and follow Jesus Christ and uh, I'm grateful for Jesus Christ. Um, I just want to stand and bear my testimony of our Savior. Uh, that it really is through Jesus Christ that all things in this world were created and that all things in this world can be perfected, can be healed, and can be whole. Uh, that it is through the atonement of Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood that healing comes into each of our lives. And it's through that glorious Sunday morning of his resurrection, that each of us will live again and have that opportunity to see God and family and be reunited. Uh, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in this world to bless our lives and to bless families. And I share this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.